This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to my Twilight Saga book marathon that, as per the most popular comment on the last video, shall henceforth be known as Twilight Breaking Dawn. If you'd like to see the precursor videos to this one, there's The Thing. The summary is this is my first time reading these books, and Twilight was pretty meh. Not the worst thing in the world, but not a very good book. I am definitely going to have to write that deep dive into The Legend of Twilight that I mentioned. I feel that just synopsisizing and reviewing these books just isn't enough to understand them, and I think... My beautiful watchers, I really need to understand them. I need to understand Twilight. Another reason I want to write this think piece is, despite my claims in the intro video that I wouldn't overcompensate for being such an ass about this series in the past, I have in fact been struggling with a lingering sense of collective guilt about how disproportionately, intensely Twilight and Maya have been scrutinized and called out for their negative qualities over the years. This has come into direct conflict with what I consider to be my responsibility as a critic to acknowledge and, if necessary, condemn these negatives when I see them, so the only compromise I can come up with is I will discuss the ethics of Twilight Hate at length later, but for now I am not going to pull any punches. Just a quick warning, the subjects of mental health, self-harm, depression, and suicide ideation will be discussed in part three, so just be aware of that if those are subjects that affect you strongly. Part one, what is New Moon? New Moon is the second of the four books that make up the original Twilight Saga by Stephanie Meyer. It was published in September 2006, a mere 11 months after Twilight, as Meyer apparently wrote it before the pilot book was published, making it possible for her to rewrite several parts to be more sequel friendly. According to Meyer, Twilight was originally intended to be a one-off, with a lengthy epilogue called Forever Dawn that would describe a much older Bella and present more mature themes. However, even before the book became a smash hit, she evidently saw more potential in writing a full sequel and and keeping it young adult friendly. Part two, what happens in New Moon? I'm going to level with you, not a lot. Here are the very few interesting moments. No, bad Jasper, <laughs> bad vampire, stop. No, no, back off. Well, this was clearly a terrible idea. Bella, you suck and I don't love you. I'm leaving forever, don't do anything dumb. <gasps> hmm. I said don't do anything dumb. It's like he's still here. Jacob! So, do you want to spend a lot of time together repairing super dangerous motorbikes to ride? I'm going to drink your blood now. <laughs> so, you saved me! I love- Bella, Edward thinks you're dead and now he's gonna kill himself! <gasps> I'm coming, Edward! <laughs> oh. And here's some of the rest of it. A few months after the end of Twilight, Bella is trying to live happily with her beautiful undead squeeze, but she's plagued with nightmares of turning 18 and being physically older than Edward, and he is still adamant that he will not turn her into a vampire. When the Cullens decide to throw her a birthday party, she manages to get a small paper cut on her finger, and Edward's brother Jasper is driven loopy by the smell of blood and tries to attack her. Edward fends him off, but Bella is further injured in the struggle. Bella then laments to Edward's father Carlisle that sparkles should just turn her already, but her daddy vamp explains that Eddie Boy doesn't believe that vampires have souls and doesn't want to damn Bella to oblivion if that's the case. Edward is so shaken by the event he nopes out of the relationship and out of town, taking his family with him. Bella is so distraught she wanders off into the woods, falls down comatose, and has to be rescued by search parties. She spends a couple of months in a heartbroken, zombified state until her dad starts genuinely considering sending her away, so she pretends to socialize with her friends for a bit. By chance, she discovers that if she does reckless things, she can hear Edward's voice in her head telling her off, and, desperate to have even a hallucinatory version of him back in her life, she starts intentionally seeking danger out. She gets her hands on some ancient motorbikes, and figures riding those around will do the trick. To get them in working order, she enlists the help of her young friend Jacob, who is a bit of a gearhead. Clearly infatuated with her, Jacob readily agrees, and, to Bella's surprise, she finds him a joy to be around, as he is perpetually cheerful, caring, and considerate. Of course, she only feels sisterly affection for him because her one true love is the dead guy who is none of those things to her. With Jacob's unwavering support, Bella starts to feel almost human again, but never quite lets go of her plan to place herself in danger. BT dubs her dad warns her to be careful in the woods because there have been sightings of wolves the size of bears running around. Later, Jacob confides in Bella that he fears a gang that lives on his reservation who do reckless things like wearing cut-off shorts and cliff diving. 
Apparently Maya couldn't think of any attire more intimidating than jorts. Gang might in fact be a misleading word, as they mostly just do community betterment projects and assist the emergency services. In fact, everyone seems to love their group's leader, Sam, but Jacob has seen mutual friends appear to change personalities completely after spending time with him, and fears he will be next to fall under his sway and become a lackey. Sure enough, after appearing to fall sick for a few days, Jacob starts avoiding Bella completely, despite her ever-increasing attempts to stalk him. She, uh, learned a few tricks from Edward, I guess. On a visit to the meadow where Edward gave her his first sparkle display, Bella runs into Laurent, one of the vampires used to hang with James, the vampire who tried to kill her in Twilight. He mentions that Victoria, James's mate, is out to get revenge on Edward by killing her, and had sent him ahead to scout around. Unfortunately for Bella, even though he knows he'll get in trouble for it, he skipped breakfast and is now too hangry not to eat her. However, just in the nick of time, the before-mentioned massive wolf show up to chase him off. Bella decides that enough is enough, and confronts Jacob, worrying that he has been initiated into the cult of shirtless hunks. It turns out that yes, he did join the gang, but only because he discovered he was a werewolf, and the gang is a pack of werewolves sworn to protect their land and its people from vampires, as they proved by tearing Laurent to bits. When she tells his naked, sweaty man friends that Victoria is coming for her, they set about protecting her, but after a few days, Bella decides to jump off a cliff. I mean, there's a bit more setup to it than that, but not much. Conflicted over her growing feelings for Jacob, she decides to try another high-risk sport, and chooses jumping into the sea from a great height. However, she doesn't consider the water below, and is immediately swept out to sea in a vicious riptide. Fortunately, Jacob is nearby, and always keen to take his shirt off, so swims out to save her. Alice, Edward's vampire sister, who has future seeing powers because why not, unexpectedly comes back to town as she saw Bella jump in a vision, and wanted to see if she was still alive. Edward apparently gets the wrong end of the stick, and believes that Bella is dead, so flies to Italy to get the Volturi, a powerful vampire family, to kill him. Ignoring Jacob's plea, He's not to, Bella goes after him, and just in the nick of time stops Edward from exposing himself to daylight in front of humans, thus forcing the other vampires to kill him for breaking the only law of vampires, i.e. don't let on with vampires. The Volturi decide to let them go, but warn Edward that humans are not allowed to know too much forever, so he either has to turn or eat Bella soon, or they will do it. When they get home, Edward admits that he still loves her, and only left because he thought that she would be safer without him, so she immediately takes him back, and equally fast jumps right back into the turn me into a vampire already argument. She makes Edward's family vote on it, and they agree the smartest thing to do is turn her. Edward manages to negotiate with her into waiting at least a bit, and apparently into marrying him by trading being the one to turn her when the time comes. Jacob then snitches on her about the bikes and cop blocks Bella by reminding Edward that if anyone bites her, then the truce negotiated generations ago between the werewolves and the vampires in this part of the country would be nullified and there would be an urban fantasy war. Gods forbid that would be something interesting happening. The end. Part 3. So, what's the crack? Is New Moon any better than Twilight? No, I think if anything it was even more meh. Alas, boring is definitely the word for this book. So little happens. Most of the chapters are about Bella using Jacob to get over Edward, while Wolfboy tries to insinuate himself into her life romantically, but uh... We'll come back to that. The climax appeared to be starting slightly sooner this time, and I held out hope for a brief moment that this book was slightly better structured than Twilight, but uh... Nope, it was still super short and pretty disconnected from the rest of the plot. The only reason it appeared to have begun at a reasonable time was because there's four more chapters of absolute nothing afterwards, so the structuring is actually worse. Her writing in general certainly hasn't improved, but then again she did write this book immediately after the first one, so I don't know what I expected. Gifted with gifts is this book's line that had me laughing until I cried and reevaluated my life a little. Though it was closely followed by this infamous line where my Maya used three synonyms for the same thing sequentially. I knew about it in advance, and it still hurt my brain a little. This book, I'm sure unintentionally, really drives home just what a colossally negative effect Edward has had on Bella. I can't say exactly how much because of how little time and information we're given to get to know her before she became completely Edward orientated, but I'm confident in saying she was a functioning human being before he came into her life. Now she goes literally comatose when he leaves, and she describes the feeling of having a hole in her chest when he's not around. A lot! My 
goodness, she brings that up a lot. She describes the feeling of him being back as being finally able to breathe again. Edward described her as his drug, but it's pretty clear that she's highly addicted to the point of dependence to him now. The only reason she makes it to the end of the book is by transferring some of her runaway codependency onto Jacob. This is just, I mean... It's Relationship 101, Amateur Psychology 101, just Common Sense 101. You mustn't be so completely dependent on another person being around to be a fully-fledged person. It's so unhealthy, it's painful to see it glorified as romantic here. The same can obviously be said of Bella's attempts to self-harm in order to feel something again. Like I touched upon last time in regards to Edward, a lot of these things would have been perfectly fine to include in a book if the author had recognised them as the intensely negative things that they are, but they're just not presented that way. Nothing in this book seems to suggest that they were anything less than the correct and romantic reaction to each situation. I don't need it spelled out like an after-school special, I don't need Bella to address the audience and say what she's learned today, but I just need something, just anything that shows me that Maya knows this isn't healthy so I can stop feeling like I'm taking crazy pills. Now, if it's ever occurred to you that Bella could really benefit from therapy, well, unfortunately that comes up. After Bella has been in her zombie girl state for a few months, her dad broaches the idea to her and she aggressively shoots it down because she thinks that if she opens up to someone, she'll be put in a straitjacket. So right off the bat here, Maya rubbed me up the wrong way by perpetuating the myth that if you're just a little too crazy, a therapist will send for the men in white coats. Even assuming that Bella would have to explain the supernatural element of her relationship to learn to move on and be a whole person on her own again, which she obviously doesn't, that's just not how inpatient works. She wouldn't be displaying any suicide ideation or anything else that would oblige a professional to take custody of her. So yeah, there's a lot of bad messages in this story ranging from overt to probably accidental that I just really didn't care for. Utilising things like depression and self-destructive behaviour to enhance a romance story is something that I feel should be approached carefully and responsibly and unfortunately Maya seems to be proving herself distinctly unable or unwilling to do that. I guess irresponsible is the next word that I would put on the back of this book if they were somehow insane enough to ask me for a quote, shortly followed, I'm afraid to say, by ignorant. I wouldn't say maliciously so. I have seen nothing to suggest that Maya is a bad person, but some serious problems arise from her apparent desire to incorporate a lot of real-life elements into her books to keep them grounded, combined with her equally apparent complete lack of willingness to do any research on these real-life places and people. Allegedly, she didn't even visit Forks, the Washington state town that she set her books in prior to writing them, or contact any people who live there. This resulted in some geographic gaffes, like people driving to cities that are at least half a day's travel away in under an hour, which is fairly harmless, but significantly less so when she also decides to co-op an actual Native American tribe and tie them into her sexy werewolf plot. Jacob's tribe, the Quileute, and their reservation are very real. They have a real culture and a real history that she appropriated and rewrote both to suit her story without any consultation or any evident attempt to educate herself about them. Incidentally, the real-life Quileute people have been dealing with ever-worsening coastal storms for decades and fairly recently have started fundraising to relocate their town somewhere safer. If you'd be willing to make a contribution, I'll put a link in the video description and I'll be donating a portion of this video's ad revenue. In addition to showcasing what a mess Edward has made of her, this book also really builds on the Bella is not a very nice person theme. On the few occasions she deems her human friends worthy of thought, she has a continual sense of superiority over them and their silly human problems when she's got cool immortal vampire stuff to worry about. Despite having dubbed him a Labrador in the last book for paying too much attention to her, she starts this story resentful that her friend Mike doesn't follow her around anymore. That said, bugger Mike, that dude's as much an arse as every other vile character in this. I'm not convinced that she can be accused of toying with Jacob's feelings, and we will come back to that, but it is not in question that she used him for her own ends, either his abilities as a mechanic or as a methadone replacement for her Edward addiction. She also briefly teams up with Jacob's other BFF, Quill, who is also distraught and frightened about his odd behaviour, however he drops out of her mind zone the second she's in on the secret. No consideration at all that he's still out there in the cold, worried sick about him. I have less to complain about regarding Edward, only because he was in the story less. He's still beyond awful when he was around. Not only does he not apologise to Bella for faking not loving her and leaving, he actually has the gall to give her a hard time for believing 
blaming him too easily. On one hand, well, yeah, duh, he was very transparent in his real motivations, but on the other hand, bugger off, you pale piece of blame-deflecting shit, I hope you get hepatitis from your next drink of blood. In addition, as much as I do believe that he genuinely thinks that Bella would be better off as a human, his attempts to withhold any agency she might have in the matter goes way past acceptable levels of controlling. Oh, also, Edward steals the mix CDs that he made her, all photographs she has of him, and the car radio that his family got her for her birthday when he leaves. His logic was that he thought that she would have an easier time getting over him with no mementos, but there is no situation where that is not a patronizing dick move. Okay. Let's talk about my boy Jacob. For almost all of this book, Jacob is a happy, positive, thoughtful person with a good sense of humor and a strong moral compass. Even though he physically can't disobey Sam's orders to not tell Bella anything, because apparently werewolf pack leaders have a certain amount of control over their pack members, he still finds a way to let her know the truth and keep his promise to never abandon her like Edward did. He tries to keep his promise even though he knows that he might not get as much out of the relationship as he wants, even when he's been ordered to stay away from her, even though it involves risking his life. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I can't even, I'm not gonna fight this anymore. I'm just gonna... Yeah. Yeah. There's a brief moment where Bella is frightened of Jacob because she incorrectly thinks that he's been killing people, but Jacob thinks that she's just disgusted by him being a werewolf, but they talk it out and are brought closer because of it. Well, bugger me, good communication helps. That's almost a healthy message about relationships. I have to admit, I flipped back and forth a few times regarding how Bella was treating Jacob, and specifically if she was intentionally manipulating his feelings for her own gain. I definitely would not say that she was leading him on, partly because at this point that term has been so weaponized against women who don't give men the sex they're entitled to, it makes me feel dirty just to say it, and partly because when asked directly, Bella is honest with him that she doesn't want to pursue a romantic relationship. Whether or not she's being honest with herself about it, Jacob has an answer, and if he wants to stick around in the hope that she changes her mind, that's on him. Admittedly, there was one moment when she intentionally lied to him about being maybe willing to date him, but I am going to risk shocking you all by defending that by saying that if you genuinely think it's necessary to preserve their safety, it is justifiable to mislead someone romantically. That's basically the dynamic of Katniss and Peter in the first Hunger Games novel. For real though, it's a trope in romantic stories, usually comedies, where someone will enlist the help of someone they don't initially feel for to gain or regain the affections of a love interest, only to, at the last minute, realize the right person for them was in front of them the whole time. I have to admit, the inversion of the trope that involves the lead going back to the jerk that broke her, thus immediately abandoning the person who was helping to put her back together again, is surprising, because no one would ever expect anyone to do something that self-sabotaging. It pains me to speak ill of my sweet boy, but the way that Jacob goes about courting Bella is just bad, and you might just recognize it once I describe it because it's regretfully quite common in real life. What he does is he always presents his gestures of affection very jokingly, like, oh, you forgot it's Valentine's Day, well, I guess that means you have to be my date later, eh, tee hee? This is deceptively insidious because it backs Bella into a corner. She can't straight up reject him without it seeming like she's overreacting to a joke and making a perfectly friendly situation super awkward, but if she doesn't slap it down, then Jacob will take it as a sign that she's accepting that they're a couple now. It's like a way of trying to sidle into a relationship sideways because you know a direct question will get a negative response or you're just too cowardly to ask it. Come on, Jacob, I know you're only 16, but you've got to grow up a bit, son. Wait, is he really only 16? Only just 16? Good lord, and she's what, like nearly 19? Ugh. By the way, Reginald, where have you been? I feel like I haven't referenced you in ages. And now? A word about our sponsor. Internet security is something that affects us all. Your computer and all of your information is extremely vulnerable when you connect to any public Wi-Fi, be it in an airport, a Starbucks, a library, or anywhere else. A VPN keeps you safe during these times by filtering all of your incoming and outgoing information through a secure server. Surfshark is my personal choice in VPN as it's very affordable and it's proven itself to be reliable and efficient. If you follow the link in the video description, you'll get 85% off a two-year plan and three extra months for free. The security benefits extend to home use as well as it guarantees 
guarantees your data won't be collected and sold to the highest bidder, either illegally or legally. I'm still strongly of the opinion that it should never be legal, but until the utopian future of companies respecting us as human beings come, VPNs are essential. An even cooler benefit is, because you can choose which server you connect to around the world, you can trick your computer into thinking it's somewhere else, and bypass the geo-blocking restrictions on streaming websites like Netflix, Hulu, and Disney+. If you can't find the show you want to watch, the chances are it will be available in another country, so just Google which one, fire up Surfshark, and voila! The current special offer makes internet safety and freedom from geo-blocking just $1.77 per month. So, again, use that link in the video description, or go to surfshark.deal slash Dominic Noble, and use the code Dominic Noble. Part 4. Good lord, why do people like New Moon? I'm a little embarrassed that I was three videos into this subject and post hours of research and brainstorming trying to figure out why Twilight fans like Twilight before it occurred to me to ask the Twilight fans. I got a lot of responses which will be worked into this and later reviews. Here are some common themes that arose regarding New Moon. While I stand by my earlier rant that Maya took it way too far and handled it so badly it dips into dangerous glorification territory, this book was apparently still validating and cathartic for people who had gone through a harsh breakup, a deep depressive episode, or both. In particular, the empty calendar that Maya used to represent the immediate aftermath resonated with people quite strongly. And to be fair, yeah, I am unaware of any other books that hit mainstream popularity around the time that so unapologetically told people that falling to pieces during emotional strife is okay sometimes. Beyond that, there's the obvious ego boost that comes from having yet another hottie drooling at the toes of your self-insert character, and now more bases are covered. Edward fulfills the we'll love you no matter what angle, and now bloodlust free Jacob is here to tell you that you are appealing for who you are, if you prefer that. And of course, there's the fact that my boy Jacob is a pretty cool dude for the most part. It seems Seems very reasonable to me to be into a guy who'll go out of his way to be dependable, kind, funny, positive, enthusiastic, and always do everything he can to keep his promises, even if Bella herself doesn't want him. Moving on to a strictly writing perspective, there are two scenes in this book that I personally thought were so well written, atmospheric, and engaging, they felt completely out of place with the rest of Maya's work. The first is the arrival of the wolf pack when they save Bella from La Ronde. Maya suddenly seems to have figured out how to build tension and pay it off all at once, and in general just did a really great job describing the scene. The other was a very brief but utterly terrifying dip into the horror genre that caught me completely off guard and left me legitimately shook for a bit. I don't want to go into too many details, but after the Volturi are done talking with the gang, Edward isn't able to get Bella out of the building before she witnesses how they feed. It turns out the Volturi run a tourist agency in the city and occasionally lure a bus full of the poor bastards into their fancy castle and devour them alive. Worst of all, the woman running the company is a human who gladly leads these people to their doom in the hopes that the family will one day make her into a vampire too. Bella sees this one woman who clearly knows or senses something is wrong and is frightened as hell, but she can't do anything to warn her without dooming herself, Alice and Edward. There's an incredible feeling of dread, helplessness, sadistic evil, and it's just disturbing levels of macabre. Now admittedly, I am a self-proclaimed sensitive soul who avoids horror at all costs, so this might have affected me more than most, but I really do think that Maya was wasted writing romance when she could have been traumatizing people with her amazing psychological thrillers. Part 5. Quickfire. I'm noticing a lot of ding roll credits opportunities as Maya either likes name dropping the title as many times as possible or titles the book after what words come up the most. Maya sometimes doesn't skip over characters filling other characters in on stuff that the reader already knows and it is exhausting. It's like watching those old animes that would do a 10 minute recap of what happened the last time in a 25 minute episode. While Bella was under the impression that Jacob was eating hikers, she self-analyzes and decides that if Edward had been actively killing when they dated, she would still have been into him, which is very yikes, but props for the self-honesty girl. The fact that Bella took a lot of looking after was kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke in the first book, but I think the fact that she now acquires a family of vampires and a pack of werewolves working around the clock to keep her alive kind of takes it past the point of being endearing. Wow, Bella actually pulls the have you tried not being gay line. I wish I could definitively say it was being used ironically or allegorically like in X-Men, but uh, I will give her this. Maya successfully recreated just how boring it is to be stuck on a 16-hour transatlantic flight. Well done. Speaking of which, uh, she clearly loves describing her characters as murmuring, whispering, saying things under their breath, basically talking really quietly all the time, and this continues when they're on the plane to Italy. 
the air steward comes over to try to hush them because their whispering might wake the other passengers. Has Stephanie Meyer ever been on an aeroplane? Those things are bloody noisy. They wouldn't be able to hear each other whispering, let alone disturb anyone else. As effective and shocking as the scene with the Volturi was, it accidentally contributed to making Bella seem like the worst person who has ever lived, because as soon as she is out of the building, she instantly forgets all about the innocent people she just witnessed die horribly, and goes back to worrying about the one thing that really matters to her getting back together with her boyfriend. I also saw a huge missed opportunity regarding Bella seeing the depths that the human woman who works with the Volturi will go to to get immortality. There was so much potential there for that leading to her questioning her own determination to receive it, but nope, that's poof, gone too. At one point towards the end, Edward says that he's going to explain to Bella what she means to him, and I optimistically got excited believing that I was going to finally get an explanation for their love beyond my existential crisis inducing theory of the last episode but instead of saying a single nice thing about her, he just launches into a corny metaphor about the stars in the sky to describe the effect that she has on him. Don't you just love it when someone talks about themselves when they describe how awesome their partner is? Both in the book itself and in Maya's public essays about her work, she made multiple comparisons between her characters and Romeo and Juliet, and oddly enough, I'm actually okay with this. Partly because you can see the obvious parallels between Edward and Romeo ending their life because they misunderstood their loved one's living status, and partly because from a story's perspective, Romeo and Juliet is garbage too. Come at me, Shakespeare bros. Sam the werewolf's fiance, Emily, has a huge disfiguring scar on her face that was initially passed off as a bear attack, but Jacob later reveals to have been an accident with Sam, and I kinda want to know more about that, because I very much see another potential accidental allegory for something terrible brewing here. We'll see, I guess. Okay, I uh, guess that's about it. You know, I really thought that this story was a love triangle. I mean, more specifically, I thought that this was famously a love triangle about Bella having to choose between these two sexy teen hunks. That would have made more sense to me. Having multiple hot dudes throwing themselves at you and having your pick of them is a fantasy I could relate to, but... Bella doesn't seem to feel that way about Jacob. At one point, she, in as many words, thinks that she might be willing to settle for him in the absence of Jacob, but the second the vamp is back in the picture, she drops Wolfboy harder than she fell off the cliff, so it's not so much a triangle as a straight line. And I think I've made it quite clear which choice I think would have been better. Admittedly, Jacob does become really douchey in the epilogue, like genuinely nasty and vindictive, and more than a little controlling too. Oh well, you know what, I'm sure he'll be back to his sweet, sweet self in the next book. It's, it's fine. He's fine. He's just having an off day. It's fine. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Do tune in for the next installment where we'll be looking at Eclipse. If you enjoyed this video and would like to help keep my channel safe from the horrors of the YouTube algorithm, be sure to boop that like button, leave a comment, share on the social medias, and subscribe if you're new. Please take care of yourselves out there, and I will see you soon. Cause he thinks he smells delicious But you can't look away each time I'm getting shirtless In the woods with my bros having werewolf fights Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor Shelby Hope, Sam Cucinotta, and Atel Spurdloff And special thanks to this video's co-producer Kate Robinson Be sure to check out her channel for more of that sweet, sweet YouTube content Why are there no pockets on this dress? That's ridiculous that he has been initiated into the cult of shirtless Hanks, Jacob to get over Edward, while I didn't, didn't even know you were in here, so Terry, do not rub your face on the tripod, you naughty floof. I think I just understood the female experience a bit better.